So this lecture is about the evolution of magmas. This is the third and last in the series about how magmas form and the sort of rocks that they are. Um, actually, it's the fourth completely for this week. So this will be the fourth of the of the series of lectures for this week. Um, and I, I've got to do it kind of quietly, actually. So it's like the middle of the night here. So I got to get this done. Um, so with the evolution, actually, this is a great photo. <laughs> this is from Sweden, and it's a place called Dead Falls. And uh, and not that that person, who's my wife, that's Nancy down at the bottom of the hole there, fell through that hole, but she was below at the bottom. And this is a place where a rock drilled a hole all the way through that, uh, that granite right there. And so pretty neat, actually. This is a place where there was a Swedish engineer who decided that he was going to make it uh, convenient to be able to dam up part of this area. And what happened was the river completely switched directions over to a new valley. And um, he was last seen in a boat in the Baltic. He was actually rowing. <laughs> uh, I think he didn't have any oars, but he was, uh, he was found out there somewhere. Um, what we talked about previously here, so this is, I'm going to give you a little bit of summary first just to make sure that this all sticks. Uh, one of the interesting things about Bowen's reaction series, it gives us a lot of predictive capabilities about what kind of rocks we're going to find. Ultramafic rocks are the most, the ones that are most commonly found in the mantle. And um, they're a little bit denser is one reason. So they sink a little deeper. Uh, in the in the earth in the earth's formation, they sank a little deeper. Uh, mafic rocks are the, are most commonly found in the uh, ocean crust. Intermediate rocks are that mixture, and they're usually found at subduction zones and volcanic rocks. And then felsic rocks are pretty much over most of the rest of the continents. And so felsic rocks, at least in the upper part of the crust, uh, that's the sort of rock that you typically find. So here's the interesting thing. This is going to help explain some things when we get to plate tectonics, but the mantle actually has a density of 3.3, and that's the density of olivine as well, 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, ocean crust, that is the stuff that's made out of basalt, and basalt has a density roughly around 3.0 grams per cc. Notice how 3.0 is lighter than the mantle, and so what that means is it would float on the mantle. And in fact, it does. And so that's what the, the ocean crustal material floats on, mantle material. Um, and so, and that's what makes up the tectonic plates, the upper part of the mantle and the, and the crust. And so continental crust, however, is closer to what um, quartz is, and that's 2.71. So the, the continental crust is actually 2.7 uh, grams per cc. So continental crust is lighter than ocean crust. So when they collide with one another, you, it winds up that the continents typically override the oceans. And that's what's happening, for instance, in, uh, in South America, in the Nazca Plate, where, where the Nazca Plate's being subducted below the, the continent of South, uh, South America. And so there's a flotation because of this. And so the density is extremely important when it comes to plate tectonics. So volcanic rocks are usually associated with plutons down below. So if we have plutons that start all the way down in the mantle and may be rich with ultramafics, as they come higher and higher in the crust, they actually evolve. They have a tendency to become more and more felsic as they get higher up, and that's because there are minerals that are, well, ultramafic that form first, that fall to the bottom of that magma chamber, get left behind there, and so it progressively makes the magmas tend to be a little bit more felsic as they evolve upward. And so that evolution is pretty common in many magma settings. Um, with mafic rocks, they tend to flow easily. Now, this is interesting, right? So if you've got single chains or double chains or, uh, or the simpler minerals that are three-dimensional, they tend to flow. Okay, so for instance, in Hawaii, you wouldn't expect a massive, huge eruption unless it involves steam. Okay, steam is the only way you're going to get a massive of extremely violent eruption in a place like Hawaii. It's just not going to happen otherwise. But uh, if you have felsic rocks, that is the rocks that are rich with quartz and, and uh, feldspars, they're going to tend to plug up that volcanic edifice. And so eventually they're going to plug it up. The 
volatile gases that are in that magma as well are going to erupt, and it's going to erupt violently. And so there's a difference between the, the rocks that are basaltic and associated with ocean crust, for instance, and those rocks that are felsic and volcanic and are associated then with continental crust. So very important stuff. Um, I think I mentioned this previously, but there's a thing called fractional crystallization. So if you have the olivine crystallize first and settle to the bottom of a magma chamber, that's going to increase the uh, felsic content of that magma. And so you may wind up with olivine and then your pyroxenes falling out and then maybe some of the other heavy, heavier uh, uh, minerals that are, uh, you know, in the mafix and so forth that are rich with iron and rich with magnesium they're going to go to the bottom of that magma chamber. Now, if they're lighter and felsic and crystallize maybe a little bit early, they're going to rise to the top of that. And so there's going to be this sort of overturn, if you will. So the felsics will accumulate at the top, and whereas the mafix and the ultramafix will be at the bottom. And so that fractional crystallization is something we call crystal settling. And so crystal settling leads to this magma differentiation. So increasing... Um, felsic composition through time. And so that's through this process of crystal settling. And so this is just a little diagram to show you the steps by which that can happen. And so they go from the, the hot down to the cooler rocks down here uh, between uh, 1200 C, 1200 degrees uh, centigrade down here to uh, 600 degrees centigrade. And, uh, you know, quartz is like 750, right? So what does it actually look like in a magma chamber? Is that a fair depiction over here on the right-hand side? Well, nobody's ever seen one except once they've been cooled and crystallized and then uplifted and then eroded perhaps even, you know. So that's the only view that we've ever had of what we think a magma chamber is except through indirect evidence. And so with indirect evidence, we're talking about things that are like uh, seismic profiles and so forth. So this is an image of a seismic profile across Long Valley Caldera. Now Long Valley Caldera, if you were to take uh, and go north from Death Valley, you would jump over one valley and you'd be in Owens Valley. And so Owens Valley is this long, straight, um, fault-controlled valley that runs on the west side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And so being on the west side, it runs up to a place to where it's, there's a lot of volcanic activity. And in that area, it's Long Valley Caldera that's been active there. Uh, if you'd go a little bit farther north, you'd be in Mono Lake. So Mono Lake is at the very tip of Owens Valley. Now, that's a place where they used to steal the water from, uh, L.A. would steal the water from Northern California, Owens Valley. But they dropped the water so precipitously in Mono Lake that they, uh, they can't really withdraw much water from there anymore. But this, this is where that valley comes through, a little bit farther to the south from Mono Lake. And they did a, a seismic profile across here, and you can see the interpretation down below here. And it shows you the uh, what more or less is about six kilometers down that there was a, a, um, a magma chamber there. And that magma chamber is pretty complex. It's, it's not a tectonic boundary, but it's pretty important boundary within a plate. So it's in the North American plate, but it's at a critical juncture between those mountains that are the Sierra Nevadas, which are predominantly composed of granite. And then there have been other volcanic uh, eruptions all along this valley in historic time that have been absolutely devastating. There's, there's one rock unit down there called the Bishop Tuff. And when the Bishop Tuff erupted, it went all the way down to Las Vegas. So it was a massive eruption that uh, deposited tens, hundreds of feet of volcanic ash uh, when it erupted. And this is the place where that happened. It was at, uh, it was in Long Valley Caldera where that blew up. Now here's a, a satellite image to show you where Long Valley Caldera is compared to Mono Lake here. And, you know, the Sierras over on the left-hand side, that's uh, like a false color image here. So that's in the blue areas over here. Would have been snow-covered probably in this photo. Um, but that's the location for Mono, uh, for, for Long Valley Caldera. Uh, you may also know it as Mammoth Mountain. Mammoth Mountain is a ski area, so it's a very popular ski area that people visit in the wintertime, of course, and, um, it's kind of a dangerous spot, actually, too, as it turns out. In this next image, it shows you the, the location of Long Valley Caldera, and then the location of where the Bishop Tuff, Tuff 
was erupted from that caldera thousands of years ago. And, um, and so this shows you the relative direction. So they were able, they've been able to map that out pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well. And so that, uh, ash has blanketed much of the Western part of Nevada, all the way down to, uh, to Las Vegas in the South. Um, so there's other volcanic rocks around here as well, but that's, uh, just kind of a little geologic map of that area and it's still active today. And so that's a cold era. Uh, the, that's surrounding this area that has had uh, active volcanism down below it. And so there's a whole bunch of cinder cone volcanics. And so we're going to get to the cinder cones uh, next in, when we start talking about uh, volcanoes next week. I'm actually a little tiny bit ahead in the lecture schedule right now. Uh, I should be wrapping up on minerals right now, but we've actually launched on igneous rocks and and believe me, we're going to get caught up when we get into volcanics because volcanics are pretty important. And so, um, anyway, this is uh, one edge of that caldera, close to where the ski area is. And what you see there are an area of, of degassing from that uh, magma chamber. There's actually CO2 that escapes from that magma chamber. Some chemical reactions occurring within the the magma chamber and that release of gases, of course, killing these trees around here. Now, now you might think, you know, well, CO2 is pretty important for, um, for, for, uh, uh, photosynthesis, right? But in fact, trees have to have oxygen in order to burn the sugars that they, they need oxygen also at certain times of the day and day in order to uh, metabolize the sugars that they create through, uh, photosynthesis and so this has actually killed some of these trees that gas escape and if you're an unlucky hiker as well you got you got to watch and, and watch the signs around here so they you know you don't go hiking through a landscape that doesn't have any <laughs> foliage on it like that um, and they post signs around here it's like look out don't don't hang around here it's a co2 hazard area and um, and people have died here actually, so they go hiking out in the woods here. Next thing you know, they stumble across an area, and then pff, they pass out because of the CO2. Um, so um, so the gases are still escaping. There is hot magma down maybe maybe five kilometers down, six kilometers down in that area, and and this is kind of a uh, well, they show it here being seven kilometers down. This is kind of a cross section of what geologists thinks, think are going on down there based on the seismic profile. So if you can imagine shooting sound waves into the subsurface and those sound waves um, being reflected off of certain critical interfaces in the subsurface, so major bedding planes and, and uh, features around that uh, magma chamber will reflect the sound back upwards, and they can image it that way. And so what you're seeing here is crystallization on the upper part up there with the, the felsic magmas and everything at the very top of that, of course. But then there's actual molten material down below, the actual magmas below that. But you can see here where there have been plumbing, uh, well, conduits essentially that will allow for the eruption of certain um, magmas to uh, to actually become volcanic in origin. Now, this thing hasn't erupted recently, but uh, it has been uplifted uh, a little bit too. So it is on the radar for people to pay attention to. So people are kind of concerned about this area more so than Yellowstone, I would say. So Mammoth Mountain is probably a little bit more dangerous. So if we were talking just about magma differentiation today, that would be the end of it. But I still have to tell you about rock identification. That's going to be the part you do in lab. You're going to get it from your lab instructor as well. But let me tell you my take on it as well. Uh, because you're going to be asked some things. You know, you're going to have to make some decision decisions. Is this ultramafic? Is it mafic? What are the minerals in it? You know, can you identify those minerals? That sort of thing. And so... We're going to have you identify igneous rocks when you get to that lab. I think you're probably doing the mineral uh, test this week, I think it is. Anyway, some of you have contacted me and said that you're going to be um, um, taking the test here. But, uh, but for this course, for this part of the course, which is the lecture, we won't have the exam for another couple of weeks here, roughly. So um, maybe it's a week and a half or so. Tomorrow we get this quiz, though.
So this is all stuff that's got to be on the quiz. This one and the previous three uh, that were posted for week three here. Um, okay, as we do this, um, when I look at these rocks, and here's a slide, five different rocks are shown on here. One of them's green. Why, hey, guess what? That's made out of olivine. Easy enough, right? Not easy if you're colorblind, however. So if you're red, green, colorblind, you're going to have to ask your teaching assistant, it's like, what color is this? Okay, but remember that green indicates ultramafic minerals, olivine being one of the principal uh, ultramafic minerals. And so that is dunite is the name of that, or peridotite um, is, it, it, they're both the same. Uh, so peridotite and dunite. Maybe you're familiar, in fact, with peridot, which is the gem quality version of, of olivine. And so olivine, pretty hard, like a seven, seven and a half. And uh, sometimes when it comes in sizable um, pieces, <laughs> sizable crystals, they can be faceted and turned into jewelry. Well, that's peridot. So peridot is a type of olivine. And so we call the rock peridotite, you know, after peridot. And the other version is called dunite. And so dunite has probably a little bit more, um, I think it has uh, iron oxide. It's got some magnetite in it, I think, that makes it dunite. Um, other rocks on here, you can see a very dark rock, and that's gabbro. So gabbro and basalt are like this. So if you have a basalt at the surface that's being erupted, that means it, at depth there's probably going to be a gabbro that will crystallize and form at depth. And so gabbro is the, the phaneritic version of basalt. Basalt, you can't see the crystals. And so because of that, if it's phaneritic, and mafic like this, the dark color is going to be mafic. That's going to be gabbro. Some people call it black granite. So, um, as, a, that, as a marketing ploy, and so when people make um, polished slabs and things like that, put on counters or whatever, uh, that would be called black granite in the in the trades for uh, for that sort of uh, material. But we call it gabbro in in uh, sciences, and so. Gabbro is pretty important in ocean crust, as you might suspect, right? So if most ocean crust is made out of mafic minerals, that's going to include gabbro as well as basalt. So basalt, pretty important also. Um, when you look at the bottom down here, one of them is white with pink crystals in it, big pink crystals, two sizes of crystals. You've learned that that means that it's called porphyritic. In this case, you can see both sizes of crystals, which means that it has to have cooled inside of the earth. And so that's an intrusive rock, but it's still porphyritic. You can still get porphyritic rocks that are intrusive in nature. They can be both extrusive and intrusive for porphyritic rocks. Um, so in other words, they can be plutons. They can form in a pluton, like in the Black Hills. Or it could be like, uh, like that uh, rhyolitic uh, composition volcanic ash that was erupted in the St. Francis Mountains, the one that, it's the Munger Mountain rhyolite, actually, and so it has little white crystals. If you recall, I talked about salt and pepper sort of texture there, uh, but little white uh, feldspar crystals floating in a ground mass uh, that was dark red. This is felsic and phaneritic, so therefore it is easy to call it a granite, but because it has two sizes of crystals, we're going to call it a granite porphyry because of the porphyritic texture. So granite porphyry, two sizes of crystals. In this case, the pink crystals are really large, and that's the potassium feldspar. On the left-hand side, all the crystals are roughly the same. We like to call that um, equidimensional sort of crystals, or um, oh God, what's the other term we use for it? Well, I, I'm not an igneous specialist. I'm a, I'm a sedimentologist and a stratigrapher. Um, yeah, equigranular, that's it, equigranular sort of texture uh, with this granite here. And so the quartz is going to be the gray areas, and then the feldspars, again, the potassium feldspars, are the reddish and pinkish sort of crystals in here. Uh, this also has either some biotite or some uh, horn blend in it as well. I think it's all biotite for the most part here, so a few black specks in there. Uh, as well, but that's pretty typical of a granite. And so granite here on the left-hand side, granite porphyry on the right-hand side with slightly larger crystals. Dunite in the upper right, uh, gabbro in the middle, yeah, the darker one there, and then diorite. Diorite is the equivalent of andesite. So if andesite is a volcanic rock, diorite's going to be the intrusive rock that would be in the magma chamber below 
um, in, in the magma chamber that might erupt and have um, an andesite at the very top. So diorite is the name of that. Its intermediate composition is reflected in its color. So it's kind of a medium gray. So it's not a light gray. It has to be kind of a medium gray like this. And so that's what you would look for with diorite. So notice what we're doing here. We're looking, can we see the crystals? That's one of the questions we ask. And then the second one is what color it is. And so for the size of the crystals, that you know, is it aphanitic or phanteritic? We call that its texture. And then for the composition, we would say it's one of those four terms that we use. And again, those four terms are ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic. Felsic is going to be pink, tan, white, uh, red of any sort. And then intermediate is going to be that medium gray. And then when it comes to mafic, it's going to be black. And ultramafic are going to be green. So there's four columns right there, if you will or four rows, it depends on how you want to put it together. And then those textures, the textures would be, in this case, every one of these is either phanteritic, or in the case of the granite porphyry, it's porphyritic. So you can see the crystals in all these. That means that every single one of these was an intrusive rock. So next on the list here, show you a few more rocks here. Here are some extrusive rocks. <laughs> um, in the upper part up there, you recognize obsidian. Obsidian is that volcanic glass. Again, glass is not made out of minerals. That's a trick question that your teaching assistant may try to, like, you know, trick you with. What kind of minerals are in this? And say, well, there are no minerals in that because it's made out of glass. It's an amorphous substance. But obsidian, as it turns out, even though it's black, we don't consider all obsidians to be mafic in composition. Now, there are some, okay? Now, for instance, in Hawaii, there are some glasses that are erupted from, let's say, Kilauea. If when Kilauea erupts, sometimes it, they, they cool so fast that it flash freezes, we like to say. When it flash freezes, it forms glass. In Hawaii, there are little long strings of this stuff, and it's called Pele's hair. We're going to talk about it more when we talk about volcanoes, but... That is an example of a mafic glass, but this one is a felsic glass. But it's black, you say. Why is it black and still considered to be felsic? You remember the, do you remember the piece of snowflake obsidian that I showed you earlier? And I said that the snowflakes in there are where it's beginning to devitrify. The glass is actually beginning to become crystalline. And so that's what the snowflakes are in snowflake obsidian. That's what it normally would look like if it wasn't glass. And so the black in that was actually just some impurities. And so, but anything, when that's going to crystallize, it's going to crystallize to a slightly lighter color. And so that's, a, that's actually an igneous version that is felsic. That glass is felsic right there. Um, for rhyolite, it's obvious to see that that's felsic. For the volcanic tuff, the samples that we have anyway, easy to see it's felsic as well. And the reason is because one's pink and one's white, right? So that's all we look for for describing the composition. And I'm, you just going to have to remember this, that, that the obsidian pieces that we have are actually felsic in composition. Now, can you see the crystals? Uh, in the obsidian, that is just part of that obsidian flow. The, the glass just actually oozes out many places where you actually have obsidian forming in nature, it just oozes out, just like you were making a blowing glass or something like that, right? So your glass just kind of like folds out across the, and there's no crystals in it, right? So it just flows on out and then finally freezes there. That's about it for that. And, and so that's, uh, it is an extrusive rock because it's a glass. Now, the other has it, it had to flash freeze in order to do that, and you only get that at the surface. For that rhyolite down here, now that's an unusual kind of rock. Um, it is rhyolitic in composition. In other words, it's felsic in composition, but when you zoom in on that, you can't see very many crystals. There's a few that are visible, but not very, very well. There's a few linear sort of pieces in there as well. That actually comes from uh, central Nevada. Uh, collected that actually. So that actually has a rare mineral in it sometimes. It, sometimes you'll see little red specks in it and it actually came through a 
metamorphic rock and picked up some pieces of that metamorphic rock, little tiny pieces of garnet in it. And so there are garnets that are actually in that. But that's a volcanic rock because you can't see really large, not to the naked eye, you can't really see big crystals in it. On the right-hand side, that's the volcanic tuff. And instead of actually seeing crystals in there, you're seeing fragments of other rocks. And in fact, very common in that one, you actually can see some of the pumice. So pieces of pumice are in this as well. Well, that tells us that there was not only pumice in this, but when it erupted, it was very violent. And it broke these other rocks apart and incorporated them into this volcanic tuff. And so that is the second version. <laughs> As I didn't have any um, to pumice on here to show you, but that's another one of the rocks that you're going to see in your lab set. Um, so that finally gets us to the last slide here, and probably the most important slide for igneous rock identification. So what I've tried to do here is to show you the equivalence for the rocks that are volcanic with the rocks that are plutonic. Rhyolite and granite go together. Rhyolite the extrusive, granite the intrusive. Rhyolite porphyry, like like the one the Mugger Mountain rhyolite, the the one that has the salt and pepper sort of look to it. That's equivalent to perhaps a granite porphyry in the subsurface. Uh, for andesite, that's the extrusive rock. Diorite, the intrusive rock. Andesite porphyry and diorite porphyry. Now, they're not one-to-one -one necessarily for the porphyries on these things. Uh, for basalt and gabbro, they go together like this as well. Gabbro inside the earth, basalt at the surface. Basalt porphyry, same deal, right? So gabbro porphyries, you can have those in the subsurface. And we, haven't, we don't even, even have any samples of this. But for peridotite, the peridotite that you've seen here that's made out of olivine, the name for the rock that is the extrusive volcanic rock for that says they're pretty rare, but it's called a comadiite. And so comadiites are equivalent to the peridotite that would form deep inside of the earth from, you know, cooling a magma chamber. Um, so there's a comadiite porphyry and a peridotite porphyry that you could have as well. Over on the left-hand side over here, you can see the mineral compositions again. One, once more, I'm going to do them in reverse order this time. We're going to go from the coolest rocks first. That's the felsic rocks. Gives you the color that's associated with them. Reds, whites, tans, light grays. Um, for the intermediate rocks, medium gray. Uh, that's a medium. Um, and it shows you the rocks that are associated then. So andesite and diorite are intermediate. Mafic rocks would be basalt and gabbros. Right? And then ultramafic, of course, the comadiite. Com and then also the peridotite. Um, so the textures are at the top, pretty easy. Phanaritic, you already know. Affinitic, you know. Porphyritic, in fact, I could tell you that you're going to see a couple of those terms show up on this quiz coming up here. Uh, porphyritic, obviously, two stages of cooling, which would indicate slow cooling first, and then uh, more rapid cooling uh, afterwards. And so that would be porphyritic sort of texture that you would have. Uh, glassy, of course, is associated with obsidian. Pumice is what we call a frothy texture. Pumice, if you were to like try to figure out what its mineral content is, you're going to find out that it's glass also. I don't know if you've ever seen like spun candies that are like like taffies and you pull it and you pull it and, and it's like strings of, of stuff. Well, that's kind of what pumice is as well, but it's made out of glass. And then fragmental is what we're going to give for the name of a volcanic tuff. So you're just going to have to look at it and see if it's composed of other rocks in it. And so you're going to see the, the pumice perhaps with this volcanic tuff. The, the one anyway that we have in our, uh, in our collections for you to look at. So that's pretty much it. Um, so with this, I'm going to close out the igneous rocks until we talk about volcanoes. So that's really kind of a separate issue. So when we talk about volcanoes, we're going to be talking about the processes by which volcanoes operate. We're going to come back to these terms, obviously, so they're a good foundation for understanding volcanoes. Um, well, anyway, thanks for your uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, the quiz, once again, is going to be from noon till 10 o'clock uh, tomorrow, so you'll be able to take that on Blackboard. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye now.